Hello, I'm Dr. Crystal Marcia for Contemporary Pediatrics. Joining me today is Dr. Andrew Garner, who will be discussing toxic stress in children. Dr. Garner is a primary care pediatrician with University Hospital's Medical Practices and a clinical associate professor at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Dr. Garner, we know that overcoming challenges is a normal part of development. What separates toxic stress from the typical stressors experienced by children and adolescents? So I think it's important when we start talking about stress, we remember that the, when we're talking about the response to stress and not the stimulus. So I think we sometimes think about toxic stressors, but when we think about toxic stress, what we're really talking about is the physiologic response, the biological response to the stimulus. And um, basically, uh, you know, positive stress um, is stress that's brief and we're able to return to baseline. So parents or our own social emotional skills allow that physiologic stress response to get turned off. Um, toxic stress is when that there's an inability to turn it off basically um, because there's that chronic physiologic stress that in turn results in changes biological adaptations that are probably productive in the short run but are certainly maladaptive in the long run. So can you tell us a little bit about you mentioned that some changes go on can you tell us about the science linking toxic stress to enduring biologic and neurologic changes? Sure. So, I mean, I think we've known for a long time that early adversity is uh, linked with um, a number of uh, adverse outcomes down the line. And so the question's always been, what's the biology underlying those very strong and well-established associations? And certainly the adverse childhood experiences study is one good example where you have adversity in childhood, a big black box, and then things that happen years down the line. And so the question is, what's inside the black box? What's the biology that's going on in there? Uh, and advances in basic developmental science are letting us know that there are two biologically related but at least conceptually distinct mechanisms by which early adversity literally becomes embedded in the body and alters developmental life course trajectories. And uh, those two, at least two of those uh, examples would be epigenetics uh, and neuroscience. So epigenetics is an important thing I think for pediatricians to understand because it really is just part of a larger revolution in our understanding of how the genome functions. So we tend to think of the genome as being a relatively um, static thing that you inherit these genes and that's your destiny. Um, but what we're learning now is that the genome is really much more plastic. And so of course epigenetics means above the genome and what it refers to are changes in gene expression that are not related to changes in the DNA sequence. We haven't altered the DNA sequence we've changed which genes are expressed when and where. And what we have learned is that stress is an important moderator of this, that stress can leave literally epigenetic marks, these little marks in the DNA uh, that determine which genes get turned on when and where. Um, and so uh, it's really important to understand because if you inherit a gene, say that makes it very likely for you to be an alcoholic, um, but that gene never actually gets turned on by the environment, well, that's not much of a risk. Um, uh, so I think we're starting to learn that uh, these epigenetic modifiers of the genome um, in some circumstances are very dynamic, which again makes it almost think about plasticity of the genome, um, but some of these marks are actually sort of programmed early in life and then have lifelong consequences. And so again, that's a way that early adversity can really be biologically embedded and, and, and again, maybe adaptive in the long run, but maladaptive, I mean, adaptive in the short term, but maladaptive in the long run. Similarly. Uh, we know a lot about neuroplasticity, right? And that the brain is very sensitive to the environment and which neurons are kept versus which neurons are lost at, uh, is influenced dramatically by the experiences that you have. And so the question is, are those early experiences um, sort of reinforcing circuits that are building skills, uh, adaptive skills, or are those circuits building you know, sort of reactive, uh, emotional, um, anxiety-based skills, if you will. And so uh, we have to try and make sure that those early experiences are building good skills as opposed to maladaptive skills. So you alluded a little bit to the long-term outcomes. From a behavioral health standpoint, what are those potential adverse outcomes? So yeah, the adverse child experience study is a great example where uh, the higher the number of adverse experiences in childhood, the higher the risk of just about any measure you can think of in terms of down the line, in terms of a car not only uh, unhealthy lifestyles, in terms of smoking and promiscuity, um, uh, substance abuse, um, and then the things that go along with those lifestyles, obesity, high blood pressure, cancer, diabetes. And so um, in this age of, of accountable care organizations where we're starting to think about how we can be accountable for a population of care, 
um, you know, it's the more those morbidities, those unhealthy lifestyles that are that we're focusing on. But the ACE study shows us that those the roots, the distal roots of those unhealthy lifestyles, actually happen in the first 18 years of life. Uh, and so that's sort of that sort of challenging us. Um, I think uh, to reconsider the early childhood origins of lifelong health, and it's also challenges. I think as pediatricians, do a better job of getting things right the first time instead of trying to repair things down the line. So, of course, if the if if the whole ecology, which is de determining these life course trajectories, is the issue, um, how do you change an ecology? Well, it's not easy, <laughs> clearly, and it's not something that a primary care pediatrician or a medical home can do on their own. Um, but it is something we can certainly play a role in. I think we need to have a public health approach um, where we're continuing to treat kids that have experienced toxic stress, um, but we also need a better job of screening for risk factors for it and also doing a better job of sort of primary prevention of, of nurturing those uh, healthy adaptive skills, sort of the rudiments of resilience, if it were, um, so the kids are better prepared to handle adversity in the future. Remember, positive stress I was alluding to in the beginning is not the absence of stress, um, positive stress is the ability to deal with it in a healthy manner. Um, and so we've got sort of this yin and yang in early childhood where we're trying to protect the brain um, so we don't have toxic stress, so we're able to learn adaptive skills. And of course, those adaptive skills then in turn will make, make sure there's not toxic stress in the future. Um, but it can easily, and we all see it every day in our practices, where it goes the other way, that if we're not protecting the brain, then it's very hard to learn adaptive skills, which makes it more likely to have toxic stress in the future. So this actually transitions one so I was going to ask you is if you, you know, as a practicing community pediatrician, what can someone do to identify these children who have toxic stressors in their lives and intervene to change the eventual outcome? Well, again, I don't think we can do it on our own. Uh, as a primary care pediatrician, I'm the first to admit that uh, we can't change the ecology on our own. We we have to be, we, but I also think we have to be part of the part of the process and part of part of the program. So I would argue that um, you know we've tended uh, to focus on uh, mental health conditions, and I would argue that you know by the time it becomes a real mental health diagnosis and a real behavioral issue, um, you know that's really treatment. You know, and I think as pediatricians we understand that. Kids are just a barometer for what's happening in their environment. Um, and so by the time we have a kid that's sort of uh, maladapting, as it were, and acting out from their environment, um, we, you know, we need to treat that for sure. And we have, you know, treatments that work. So we know that kids that have experienced significant adversity, um, you know, parent-child interaction therapy and uh, child-parent uh, psychotherapy are effective evidence-based interventions. Of course, the problem is they're not, they're not enough providers, um, but we can advocate for that. You know, when we're advocating as pediatricians for more providers, and particularly if it's not something that's going to, you know, line our pocketbook, that we're pretty good advocates, right? And so we should be advocating that we need more uh, providers that can do those sort of evidence-based treatments. Um, but we've always been uh, tuned to kids that have been struggling. I think we want to try and go upstream a little bit and try and screen then. So now we're talking about sort of that public health pyramid. You know, we've got treatment at the top. The next layer down would be sort of those secondary targeted interventions, screening for risk factors. The problem with that is then a lot of the risk factors we're looking at aren't really necessarily about the child. They're about the family environment. So the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that we screen, say, for, for maternal depression because we know that maternal depression uh, is an incredible stressor on the child and the dyad itself. And so, um, you know, that is a challenge for some pediatricians because, again, they're saying, whoa, you know, I don't want to screen for something unless I have um, an intervention that I can do to treat that. Uh, and while that's certainly true, um, we also know that demands drive services. So if you're a service provider in the community, you want to know what the, what the issues are, you know, so, so just pretending like it's not there is not going to help us any. And there are some evidence-based screens out there. Probably the most famous is um, by Howard Dubowitz. It's called Safe Environments for Every Kid or SEEK. Um, and that's essentially what he's recommending is that we're doing a better job of screening for things like maternal depression, intimate, per, intimate partner violence, and those sorts of things. So that's sort of working our way uh, on the pyramid there. We've got treatment. We need to identify risk factors. But even more than that, I think we also, as pediatricians, what comes naturally to us is do a better job of primary prevention, sort of universal helping families understand what the essential biological needs of kids are. Because I think toxic stress takes – some of these issues that we feel a little queasy about, things like intimate partner violence and poverty um, and maternal depression, and make it in a biological frame. We're talking about the biological effects, and so they're just as biological. These psychosocial issues are just as biological as um, uh, lead poisoning or poor nutrition. Um, and uh, so can we use things like Bright Futures, which is an academy um, program, obviously, and, and uh, Connected Kids, 
um, to do a better job of helping and supporting families to learn about positive parenting techniques to try and uh, prevent kids from having that toxic stress. Well, thank you, Dr. Garner. This has been a great conversation. Now, this has been Dr. Crystal Garcia for Contemporary Pediatrics.